the month of October is a time when the earth begins to darken and the sun sets earlier and trees begin to die. And it's a time when people like to tell scary stories. And of course, the, the world celebrates the evil feast of Halloween, but even though we don't celebrate Halloween here, I thought it would be a nice time to tell you all a classic American ghost story. But this is a sermon, so the story is not only Catholic, it's obviously a true story also. It begins in what is now West Virginia in the year 1794, a few years after the end of the American Revolution. There was a man named Adam Livingston who had a a rather large family. He had four sons and three daughters. He was of Dutch ancestry and he was Lutheran as his whole family was too. He originally lived in Pennsylvania. And while he was there, his his home had a series of unexplained events. His barn burned down for no apparent reason. And his horses and cattle died mysteriously. And his chickens and geese would have their heads chopped off by some invisible force. So to get away from all of these things, he moved from Pennsylvania and settled in what is now the the eastern tip of West Virginia, a very, very remote and rural area. This area is is remote and rural even today. So in the 17th century, in the 1700s, it was complete wilderness. But these strange happenings followed him to his new home and even got worse. His family would hear strange noises at night, like the sound of galloping horses. Their clothes would catch on fire spontaneously, and their beds at night when they were asleep would also catch on fire by themselves. And large amounts of money, gold coins most likely, would would get lost mysteriously. But most interestingly of all, their clothes would be cut as if with invisible scissors, and they would hear the sound of, of scissors cutting as, while it happens, and then they would look at their clothing in the closet, for example, and they would see that holes had been cut into their clothing in the shape of crescent moons. And so the story of these strange misfortunes spread throughout this area, and this area became known to the locals and the neighbors as Clip Town. Clip was a, a the contemporary term for a pair of scissors. And the neighbors would call this spirit the wizard clip. And that term is how this story has become known. This obviously was the work of the devil. And even though Adam Livingston was a Protestant, he knew this, he tried to bring various Protestant ministers to come and drive the devil out of his home. Several of them came and had no success. One minister came, and as soon as he entered the house, he he ran out again in in great fear. And the next day, the family found his Protestant prayer book, uh, Book of Common Prayer, it was called. They found it in the, the chamber pot of the house. The devil had apparently put it there. That's basically a, a toilet. So Adam Livingston became overwhelmed by these misfortunes, and he was almost in despair. It seemed like nothing could save his family from this this terrible, mysterious attack. Until one night he had a dream in which he was walking up a hill. And when he got to the top, he saw a minister there dressed in a long black robe that he had never seen before. And he looked at this man curiously. And as he did so, he heard a voice that said to him, This is the man who can save you. And he woke up, and he was very puzzled by this. He didn't know what sort of minister wears a long black robe. And he went to visit his nearest neighbor. His nearest neighbor lived four miles away. And his neighbor was a a family by the name of the McSherrys. And the McSherrys will play an important role in this story. But the McSherry family was Catholic. And when they heard this story, they said, well, a minister in a black robe is a Catholic priest. And they invited him to come with them to Mass next time they had Mass in this area. 
So the next time the priest was in this area, because since this area was so remote, they only had a, 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 an occasional mission set up. Adam Livingston went along with them. And when he saw the priest saying mass, he was very astonished. And he said, this is the man I saw in my dream. So he, this, this, man, this priest was a, a priest named Father Cahill, an Irish missionary. And he spoke to him after mass. And he told him his whole story. As you can imagine, the, the priest thought he might be a little bit crazy, talking about invisible scissors and things like that. And he told Livingston that this was probably just his neighbors playing a joke on him and he should just watch and see uh, who's doing this. But Mr. McSherry spoke to Father Cahill later and he said, I think this is something serious. Can you please come to this man's house? And he managed to convince the priest to come to the Livingston home. When he, the priest went there, he spoke to the family individually and he found that their stories all matched up and they didn't seem like they were making up a story. So he blessed their home. And as, his, as he was leaving on his way out, he, he stumbled on an object on the porch and he looked down and it was a, a bag of gold coins. It was a bag that the, the, the Livingston family had misplaced or, or had mysteriously disappeared a little while earlier that the family thought they would never find again. So things were already starting to improve. Father Cahill would come and visit his family a few more times, and he said Mass at their home also a couple of times, and the, the demonic attack on this family ceased. Shortly after this, Adam Livingston and his children converted to the Catholic faith. But at the same time this happened, a disembodied voice began speaking to this family in this house. This voice appears to have been a soul from purgatory, sent by God to instruct this family in the faith and, and to form them to be good Catholics. And the Livingston family heard this voice talking to them for 17 years on a regular basis. Almost every day this voice would teach this family the catechism and instruct them and, and make them pray. And we have numerous anecdotes about things that this mysterious voice said to this family over, over these many years. The voice would make them get up in the middle of the night and, and pray for sinners and the souls in purgatory. And it would tell them to say the rosary and, and lead the rosary with them. Very often it would make them pray for even three hours in the middle of the night. It told them to keep a whole extra Lent in the year in which they converted to the faith to do this in thanksgiving for the gift of their conversion. And he told them always to keep March 4th as a holy day because that was the anniversary of their reception into the church. It didn't want them to become just ordinary Catholics, but it drove them to sanctity. Adam Livingston and most of his children would be instructed by this voice in the catechism. And in, in subsequent years, this family would be interviewed by the Bishop of Baltimore himself, Bishop Carroll, when this story became more, more well known, and he said that they seem to have been instructed from above. And the voice would constantly warn this family against Protestantism, which they had abandoned, and it would insist them to them that the Catholic Church was the only true church and that there was no salvation outside the Catholic Church. The voice told them that Luther and Calvin were in hell and that every soul that was lost through their fault added to their torments. It would tell them very often to pray for the dead. It would say, I want prayers. And we still don't know who, the, who this voice belonged to, but it did tell Adam Livingston that if he persevered, he would know who, who that person was before his death. And Unfortunately, we, we don't have any, any follow-up on, on that story, so we, we just, just don't know. A lot of these events are sort of uh, fragmentary recollections of, of the family members and, and neighbors that were written down at the time or, or, or in later years. 
There was one time Adam Livingston was working in his field and all of a sudden he, he fell down and, and seemed to be injured. And his, his sons, also working in the field, ran over to, to help him. And they saw him curled up in a ball on the ground in a terrified state, shaking with fear. And he said that he had heard a shriek from a soul in purgatory. And it, 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 it caused him to have this, this, like a panic attack. A lot of the stories of this voice and, and what it said to this family in West Virginia might strike us today as a little bit harsh, maybe, like that one. And the voice was certainly very strict in, in the way that it handled this family. But this was a time when people had a very strong sense of the justice of God and, and the punishment of sin. And people took sin a lot more seriously than they do today. And because of that, it was a much more innocent time than now. So these people could stand better the kind of fear that this voice would, would give them sometimes and even thrive on it spiritually. There was one time Adam Livingston went, went to tell the McSherry family, their, their Catholic neighbor, that the McSherry's wife's sister had died that night in Baltimore and that they had to have masses said for her right away because her soul was in purgatory. The voice had told him this message and told him to go and tell them this. And it said that she was in purgatory because she had been too indulgent to her children. And a few days later, this family received a letter in the mail informing them that the wife's sister had died. The Livingston children benefited greatly from this voice and from what it taught them. And two of the daughters are even recorded as having died in the odor of sanctity. But they did make a few mistakes. There was one time one of them attended a Protestant service and she was there during the service and, and was weeping tears at, at the, the sight of all these people around her being led astray. And when she got home, the voice told her severely that she had committed a mortal sin because the people there had thought that she had been weeping because of the, the beauty of the sermon. And they didn't know what she was actually thinking and it told her never to do that again. The voice told Mrs. McSherry that both of her parents were in heaven, but her husband, Richard, had a very severe illness. And one day he was basically on his deathbed, and he had been away from the sacraments for a few years. And the voice told Mrs. McSherry to tell her husband he had to go to confession, and he would immediately be cured of his disease. So they sent for the priest, and, and the husband went to confession and received Holy Communion. And immediately he, he fell into a deep sleep. And the following morning he woke up, basically cured, and he started walking around the house. And when the family saw him, at first they thought he was a ghost because he had been on his deathbed the night before. But he had in fact been cured. One time... Adam Livingston asked the voice if he could speak to some people that he knew that were living an evil life. And the voice said, no, these people were like the rich man in the, the story of Lazarus. It said that if they will not hear the church, they will also not hear a voice from the dead. And that is a quote from our Lord in, in the parable of Lazarus and the rich man. If you remember, the rich man asked Lazarus to warn his children not to live the way he had. And Lazarus answered that if they would not listen to the, the, the prophets, they would also not listen if he went, came back from the dead and warned them. The voice predicted that the Livingston children would live through times of great evil and that they would see war, pestilence, and famine. And that was fulfilled in the Civil War, which greatly devastated that whole area. But the voice predicted that the children would not be harmed. And even though some of the sons did fight in the Civil War, none of them were hurt by the war, except for one of the sons who was not a soldier, but he was a, a doctor and he, he worked to take care of the wounded and he, he worked so hard that his health eventually broke and, and he died. There's another rather interesting story that one day the McSherry's 
or seemed to be at the Livingston home, and they, they had their little baby in the, the cradle, and the cradle started to rock back and forth by itself. And they watched it in wonder, and, and as they watched, it started to rock more and more violently. And Mrs. McSherry started to, to run toward the cradle to try to grab it and hold it still, because she was afraid that if it rocked any harder, it would throw the baby right out of the cradle. But the voice called out to her to, to stay away from it, and it said, God is more powerful than the devil. And at that very moment, the, the cradle stopped moving. And the voice explained that it was the devil that had been rocking the cradle so hard, it was trying to throw the baby out of it to, to kill that baby. And he said that the devil knew that that baby would one day be a great enemy of his. And that baby grew up to be a Jesuit priest, and even a provincial superior of the Jesuit order, a superior over a, a very large area. There was one time one of the Livingston sons was 21 years old, and it was harvest season, and the father asked him to help with the harvest the next day. And he was 21, and it was a bit rebellious, and he, he said that he would not work unless his father paid him. And shortly after this, he got a terrible pain in his knee and was in so much pain that he had to be confined to bed. And his knee was, was uh, terribly swelled up for a, a very long time, for a year and a half. And finally, he got better. And when he got better, the voice said that he had finally satisfied the justice of God for his rebellion and disrespect to his father. What a, a terrible punishment that seems to us for, the, the something would, for something that would seem trivial today. But the voice did not allow any kind of nonsense. One of the daughters of the Livingstons died while the voice was still in contact with his family. And the voice told the family that her soul was so pure that she went straight to heaven without having to go to purgatory. But unfortunately, the mother of the Livingston family never converted to the Catholic faith. She never listened to this miraculous, discarnate voice speaking in her home for 17 years. Just imagine the obstinacy of that. And she used to joke about this and say that she was the Judas of the family. But the voice prophesied that she would die in that home and it predicted what room of the house she would die in. So one day the, she became very sick and, and thought that she might be going to die soon. And in order to evade this prophecy, she, she fled to the neighbor's house. And when she got there, she continued to get worse and worse. And, and the family brought her home, basically against her will. And they put her in bed. And a short while later, she, she got up and she started walking around the house doing a couple of things. And she forgot momentarily that the voice had said she would die in, in this particular room in the house. And as she walked past the door, she had some reason to go in there. And, and as soon as she crossed the threshold of that room, she fell dead. One time the voice was having the family say their three hours of prayer for the souls in purgatory. And one of the daughters of the family started to think that purgatory really couldn't be all that bad. And besides, it was those people's fault that they were in purgatory anyway. So why did the Livingstons have to go through so much trouble to help them out? And as soon as this went through her mind, a hand and an arm materialized in the air in front of the whole family. And it floated through the air and it touched a piece of linen and it burned a handprint into the cloth. And the whole family understood immediately why the souls in purgatory need our prayers. There was another time that the daughters of the McSherry family were, were visiting the Livingstons, and they were all trying on various new clothing in front of the mirror at the Livingstons' house, and, and one of them was admiring herself vainly in the mirror, and all of a sudden, the mirror shattered into a million pieces. And the voice constantly warned the daughters of the family not to be vain and told them that there were, 
there were so many souls in hell at that very moment for having followed the fashions of the world and could never enjoy any relief from their suffering. This is a very interesting statement. When you, when you look at pictures from women in the early 1800s, and the voice says that many of them were in hell for the way they dressed, just imagine what it would say today. It's hard to believe. Unfortunately, that linen cloth with the handprint burned into it and the, the cloths that had the, the half-moon figures cut out of them with the spiritual scissors have since been lost, but we have numerous accounts from the 1800s of people who had personally seen these things. As you can probably imagine, the events of this story were greatly discussed throughout the entire 19th century especially by the priests of that area, and and even by Protestants too. They were very well known. And numerous books have been written about these events, about the wizard clip, as it's called. And most of the priests of that time in that area believed that these these, these things were real. They saw the effects of the story, namely the, the conversion of the Livingston family and of, of 14 of their neighbors also were, were converted by these things and, and witnessed many of them. And these people would most likely not have become Catholic if the, these things were not true. But all of this is, is the fruit of, of this voice. And the accounts of eyewitnesses to these events were examined carefully by numerous priests throughout the 1800s and they found them all to be credible. In fact, there was a missionary of the early 1800s named Father Galitzin, who was one of the most important figures in the Catholic Church in that time period in the United States. And he, he traveled to the Livingston home and he spent three months there interviewing everyone who had seen anything connected to this. And he believed that all of this was true. That priest, Father Galitzin, is a sort of an interesting story in himself. He was a Russian prince who was raised as a Russian Orthodox outside the church and he converted to the Catholic faith and became a priest and his family kicked him out basically and and disinherited him from his his great wealth and he became a missionary and, and came to the Allegheny Mountains of Western Pennsylvania to be a missionary there for the rest of his life and he, he died with a reputation of great sanctity but he was a man of great wisdom and, and prudence and, and he believed that these things were true and, and wrote an account of all these events. The events of the wizard clip were, were, were very well known, as I said, but it began to be forgotten once the, the, the witnesses and their children began to pass away toward the end of that century. Although it is still very well remembered in West Virginia to this very day, Adam Livingston left a piece of land to the church in his will, the the property where these things took place. And that land has been in the continuous possession of the Diocese of Wheeling, West Virginia ever since. And it is to this day, but unfortunately now it is, the Novus Ordo Church owns it and they call it a place of ecumenical prayer. You can just imagine what, what the voice might have to say about that. But the local Department of Tourism has put up little signs on some of the, the, the places where these events took place, and they have a little picture of a pair of scissors on them, a little sort of icon, for people who want to see these places. The American missionary priests of the time, in general, considered this story to be a beautiful example of the providence of God in, in sending a miraculous visitor from the next world to a family that had never even seen a Catholic priest in order to give them the gift of the faith and and give the gift of the faith to so many of their neighbors who were converted by these things, who otherwise would never have heard of the Catholic faith. And as for us, let us take to heart what the voice said to them so many times about the need to pray for the souls in purgatory and avoid sin so that we don't lose our souls, and end up in hell as it was constantly warning them. Let us remember our last end, as the Bible says, and we will never sin.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.